very excited to be here today and get to talk to you about our machine. Uh, my team and I have worked really hard to, to get this ready for the show. And uh, we've got two machines here. One is here, one is back at our booth. And uh, if you haven't had a chance to play it, uh, we'd love to have you come there after this and do that. My, my plan for our time here today is kind of a, an informal show and tell. Uh, I want to be able to show you some of the things that make our machine really unique. And uh, I also want to have Brad, our game designer, give, have a chance to talk through some of the features of the game. And then we'll save some time just for Q&A so that you can ask questions and we can try to answer those. Uh, to start out, though, I'll introduce my team. On the left there is Brad Duke. So Brad is our game designer and uh, also our artist. He's done an outstanding job in uh, coming up with this playfield design. And uh, I think the art on the cabinet and uh, playfield is just beautiful. And he's responsible for all that. And then uh, Matthew Brzezinski uh, is one of my software developers. And uh, he's been in charge of taking the rule set that we developed and making it work on the machine. And then Gabe Hernandez is my mechanical engineer. And uh, he's responsible for <laughs> basically taking all these ideas that we have and turning them into 3D CAD so that we can actually manufacture them. So these guys and the other members of my team that aren't represented here, we have spent so many really late nights over the last three weeks to try to get this here for the show. Literally, I mean, I, I, how many 3 a.m. nights did we have over the last three weeks? There were a lot, but we, are, we love coming to these shows because it's an opportunity for us to engage with the community, to get folks to come and play our machines, and we learned so much here. Uh, we went to TPF back in March. We brought an early prototype at that time. And um, we, we had some great players play on that machine. And we learned a lot about shot geometry and how we could improve that. And we rolled all the things we learned into this design. And I think it's come so far. If, if any of you were at TPF and saw that early prototype, it didn't have all the lights. It had really conceptual color blocked art. Uh, I think it's just a, a huge difference that, that people will notice if they got to see that early machine. But um, this represents essentially what we want to take to our production model. We call this uh, this and the other machine we brought our pre-production machines. And uh, we announced at noon yesterday that we're starting, starting to take reservations for our first 100 units. We're calling it our first edition release. And as we kind of get into some of the, the technical advancements and things that we've worked on, I'm gonna talk through some of the things that we've already heard and learned at the show yesterday. And uh, kind of wanna explore those further here with you through the Q&A session. But to start out, I, I'd love to get the machine on and then uh, I wanna just kind of walk through some of the things we were trying to do and then we'll, we'll show you how it works. Should I take this mic with me? Okay. You guys want to turn? I don't think it's necessary. Just let me share my screen. So while we wait for this to come up, I'll just start to explain kind of some of the differences between this machine and some of the standard machines that you are probably used to. Uh, so what we wanted to do is I was thinking through, that's going to be loud. I'll just talk a little louder above it. So we wanted to think through what is going to make a pinball experience better for you as an owner. And I think that there are a lot of things that are opportunities that we saw that will just improve the pinball experience. One of the things for me in servicing a pinball machine that's really challenging is I don't like taking out the glass. How many of y'all enjoy taking pinball glass out of your pinball machine? <laughs> I don't see any hands up. So I, I'm definitely amongst the crowd that doesn't enjoy that part. And so I thought that that's something that we can improve upon. And so. That was uh, kind of the inspiration for this glass mechanism that I'll show you. It's a glass frame that can be completely removed from the cabinet. And then uh, in coming up with this glass design, we had to kind of work through a lot of other details about how that's going to latch. Uh, we wanted it to be well lit. And so we've got RGB lighting on the glass. And we had to kind of figure out how are we going to get that. And then um, another thing you'll notice about this cabinet that's unique is the kind of the slim design. And 
Also, the lack of a coin door is probably an obvious difference that you see. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, but the, the plan is that we've got some electronic payment system that's actually uh, through an app where you pay electronically and the coin door isn't necessary. And if the coin door isn't necessary, the depth of the cabinet isn't necessary because a lot of the cabinet's actually designed around the coin door. And so I'll start to open this up and kind of show you some of those things. So maybe I'll hand you the mic, Gabe. So first of all, to get this glass off, you can see we don't have the coin door, so you can't open the coin door and you know, take your lockdown bar off. And so what we do is we have a latch. It almost looks like the door you'd see on an RV, how they have a latch like that. It's a locking latch. It's unlocked. And if, if you're a home user, you can leave this unlocked, and then you can easily access it. It's not like the coin door. You have to leave the key in. You can't like leave it open. So you just reach under, pull the latch. kind of pops up like a trunk. And you see the machine knows that the glass has uh, opened and it shows a, a display for maintenance mode, which I'll tell you more about in a minute. But to get the glass off, we just pull it right off. And so this is the glass frame. It's a metal frame. We've got polycarbonate as the glass. This whole thing weighs 15 and a half pounds. Guess how much normal pinball glass weighs? 15 and a half pounds. So this whole frame with the lights and the polycarbonate weighs the same as standard pinball glass. I'm going to put that right over here. Is there a way that we can show them a view that would be down kind of into the play field here? Okay. Well, well I'll explain it and then y'all can come up or afterwards or whatever. But we've got a unique ball trough. And when you have the, the slim cabinet and no coin door and we've got essentially wireless, I can try this again, essentially wireless lights that are connecting to the, the machine, we can't really have all of the same uh, like ball trough down below. There's, there's not enough space to, to make all the things work. And so we actually put a ball trough above the play field and it makes the, the balls accessible. So when you open this up, the apron is part of the glass mechanism. It just comes off, and now when I want to take the balls off, I can just take them right out. And so I'll take those out, I'll put them in my pocket, and then we'll get the machine up into a service position. Now normally what I'd be doing is I'd be putting the machine in a partial service position and like activating the coil with my hand to get the balls out. So I think this is a lot easier. Okay. So Gabe is going to go ahead and show you how to get the play field into a service position. There's a handle on the play field. It comes up. You can rest it there. And then the play field is on slides that are actually resting on the bottom of the cabinet. So it's very smooth. There's no need to worry about dropping the play field into the cabinet. So he just slides it forward. It's going to stop. And then he can lift it up, and it'll go into the service position. Something else that's unique here is uh, the, the cabinet and the play field, it kind of works together as a system. So the, the play field is self-supporting. We could actually remove it from the cabinet and we don't need a rotisserie. We didn't build this with a rotisserie, we actually just built it on our workbench with its own supports. We can rest it on its side, we can rest it on its bottom like that, or even invert it. And so it makes it really easy to service. Also the wiring, there's very minimal wiring that connect the play field to the cabinet and the cabinet to the back box. We tried to make that really efficient. So again, it's easy to service, it's easy to take apart. Um, Gabe, you can go ahead and lower that and we'll show them how it slides back. So a lot of times you get this jerky motion, you gotta kinda jump over the side of the rail. This is just really smooth motion and you just rest this and set it back down. And then uh, we'll go ahead and I'm just gonna put the balls back in. Another thing with the coin door, uh, it gives you access to the four buttons that navigate through menus. And so I told you I would talk about this in a minute, but with the glass off, the machine knows that the glass is off because of the sensors down here. And it displays a QR code for maintenance mode. And uh, I'm going to bring up a website over here. So 
we have developed an app. It's called Pin Access. And if you go to pinaccess.com, which I'll bring up here on the screen, you can see some of the details about it. Essentially, Pin Access is going to do a lot of things for the machine. One, it's going to allow you to service your machine with a touch interface. So you can adjust the sound volume, adjust the brightness, control all the, the settings for your machine, the difficulty levels. Uh, you can also do things like diagnostics if you wanted to test lights or coils, test switches. You can see logs. All the things that you'd expect to be able to do through those four buttons, you can do with this app, but in a much easier, cleaner interface. And so that's service mode. Also, the app has features for login. So if you want to have high scores and achievements, you log into your account. And then, as I mentioned before, the lack of the coin door. Because we have the login system, when people create an account, they can link a payment method, and then they can pay for a game as they're logging in. And so if this was on a location for a, uh, an operator, and he's got a bunch of these machines out there, people can download the Pin Access app. They've got their account. They've got their card linked to that. They'll be able to make purchases in the app based on kind of like a gift card system. And then the vendor or the, the arcade owner will get that money immediately. And then people can use that stored balance to play games in that arcade. And our system can actually be retrofitted into anything with a coin door. So if they've got other machines, they can put a, a pin access enabled device into that machine. Our price point for that retrofit kit is going to be around the $50 range which is by far the most affordable thing out there. If you're going to try to retrofit a machine right now, you're probably going to buy card readers or other things. The pricing that I've heard about for those is probably around the $1,000 and up. And also, you're going to have monthly fees involved in that. And we're trying to keep it with uh, either no monthly fee and a very small transaction fee, or a small monthly fee and a smaller transaction fee. And so we're working out those details, and we're going to be rolling out that system with some demo arcades that we're working with and we'll test it there, and then we'll release it to everybody. So that's kind of a lot about the unique things about our cabinet and our play field and how it slides in and out, and then the reasoning behind kind of some of these things. So at this point, I think it'd probably be appropriate to have you all just ask a couple questions about that part, and then maybe we can go into Brad talking about kind of his inspiration for the game and some of that design. Please. Yeah, so, it, and it's two customers that we would have to educate. So the question was, how do we educate the customer about the app? And I think there's the, the vendor or the operator, right? So that's my customer. And then there's also their customer, the actual player of the game. And so I think in terms of working with the operators, it's something that it, it's just going to take time for them to see that it's used in these proven demo environments that I'm working with now. And when they see and have testimonials from other operators that say, hey, this is revolutionary. This is working for me. This is why it's transformed my business and made it easier for me to service my machines. I can go to my app. I can see things that are wrong with a machine on a location without going there. I don't have to go there and empty the coin box. There's just so many things that we can do with this system that are going to make their lives easier. And so I think showing them that through testimonials of other people. I think that's how I'm going to try to solve that problem. But then there's the problem of the customer adoption. And I think that there's a few ways where it's, it's a general problem with like apps and new things. So I think uh, incentivizing the customer to use the app is generally what's done. And they could do that several ways. Um, one, they could say you sign up and you get 
$5 in free credits, or uh, they incentivize also by offering free credits for purchasing extended amounts. Like they could say, hey, you can buy a $10 gift card, a $20 gift card, or a $50 gift card. Well, if you buy a $50 gift card, you get $5 free. So there's a lot of ways they can do that, but I think for me, incentivizing the operator, I'm looking to prove the system through operators that are willing to adopt new tech and use them to give testimonials to the other operators that aren't so sure. And then for their customers, it's, it's offering monetary incentives, I think. So the question is, uh, is the age demographic we're trying to attract with the app maybe an opportunity to uh, get a younger audience? I think it is. I, I don't want to limit it to that. I mean, I hope the app is universal, that anyone of any age can use it. Um, obviously, like, we've talked to some uh, operators here at the show that say, hey, my arcade is full of kids. You know, how are they going to use it? And I think it won't fit into every situation, right? It's not a, a solution for everything. But I think it's going to solve a majority of the problems for the operators. But, you know, there are always cases where maybe tokens just work better and they can continue to use those. So right now we're tying it to the location. We have the flexibility to do it both ways. And I'm going to explore that with the initial demo customers. I think that what the, the operators are going to prefer is that they get the money immediately. The, the limitation on that for the system as a whole is that when you go to Joe's Arcade and then you go to Chris's Arcade, the balance that you have in your account for both of those is going to be different. It's like you bought a, a Walgreens and a CVS gift card. You can't use your CVS gift card at Walgreens. So the system can totally work like that. I think that's what people are going to want, but we also have the flexibility to do it where it's kind of a you buy credits and those can be used anywhere, and at the time of purchase, that money is distributed to the individual operators. See, the nice thing is just by scanning the barcode on a game there, the QR code, to play, it immediately links it. Yeah. Yes. It is, absolutely. Yeah, there's a, there's the lock. And uh, so if you're an operator and you want to lock that, you just lock it. But if you're a home user, you can leave it unlocked and you don't have to worry about your coin door swinging open or something like that. So it's very convenient for home use, but also suitable for operators. So the, the question is, the game looks compact. Is it is it as light as it looks? And I, I think the answer is, it is much lighter than a normal cabinet, but not so light that people are just going to throw it around. So the, the cabinet, uh, it's all plywood. There's no MDF in this cabinet. The bottom is plywood. It's all uh, melamine coated. So the interior is very clean. Um, it's a uh, it's a premium cabinet. It's we didn't cut corners on anything. Even though it's a, a smaller form factor, um, it's top quality. And so, the the weight I think is great for moving it around, but again, not so light that it's going to interfere with normal play. People come up and play this. It feels like a normal machine. It feels sturdy, but when you want to get it upstairs to your bonus room, you don't have to break your back. So, Gabe, we kind of estimated this earlier. What do you think? Probably just a bit under 100 kilograms. Is that with the back box? Yeah, with the back box, and I'm guessing probably around 200 pounds is what we're looking at. The back box is about 30 pounds when I was first coming out, and now I move it. Um, so there is that extension of the back box that makes it more consistent with the back of the box. And then the kids probably need to check it daily. Sorry about that. 
But yeah, so the back box is about 35 pounds. That comes off separately. So when you move it, you can just, uh, as Chris mentioned, there's only three wires in the back of it that come out and the whole back box slides off of there. It's got a handle in the top. It's pretty easy to move. And then you just have to worry about getting the cabinet through the door. Normally the, the back box is the widest part of your cabinet. So as you're trying to move it around, that's what gets dinged. This is now off of there and you have a much more square uh, piece to try and move. Please. I'd love to offer this to anybody that wants it. <laughs> so I think there's some logistic things to figure out with shipping internationally. Um, yes, sir. Yeah, and standards as well. So our plan is to release 100 of this as our first edition release. It's quite possible that a majority or maybe even all of those sales will be in the U.S. I, I don't know the answer to that right now. But um, we do want to open up sales internationally. I think I need to explore what that looks like for these first 100 units. So this right here? Yeah, so uh, the, the question is if we needed to replace the, uh, the polycarbonate in this glass frame, how would we do that? It's actually held together with uh, essentially PEM studs and nuts, and so you could just use a normal nut driver and you could take this apart, and then uh, we could send you another piece of this, and then you could install it. So the question is, how durable is this compared to regular glass? Well, I would say that this is much more durable than regular glass. I mean, it's made of polycarbonate. Polycarbonate is what they use for like bulletproof glass. So if we had regular glass and I took a hammer and hit it, it would just shatter. If I hit this, it's just gonna bounce off. Um, in terms of scratch resistance, uh, for production, we're gonna be using abrasion resistant polycarbonate. Uh, I have samples of that at my workshop. Essentially, if you took a Brillo pad and just kind of rubbed it on it, you won't see any scratches. So if people are cleaning this with like a normal cleaning cloth, they've got some dust on their microfiber rag, you're not gonna see any scratches on that. And again, the, the weight is much lighter than glass and that's why we're able to do all that metal and the apron and the glass and the lights all within the same weight as normal pinball glass. And so the material here, that material cost me about five times as much as a piece of glass. And so, it, again, it's, it's a premium product that we're using because we think it's the right product for the job. Handling glass, trying to pull it out of the front of the machine, it's a process I don't enjoy and I don't think really anybody enjoys. It's just part of what pinball is right now and I hope that this can help make it a better experience. So yeah, there are some uh, UV impacts to polycarbonate if it doesn't have like a special coating to be UV resistant. They do have polycarbonate windows that are used in houses and outdoor environments. Obviously those are designed to be more UV resistant and we're gonna try to use the best product that we can. You know, in 30 years from now, is it possible that it'll suffer from slight yellowing? It's possible, but it's also an easily replaceable component. Well, I think the, the whole cabinet is designed as a system. And so I think as we started to kind of rethink how things could work, like the getting the back box to work together with the play field, to get to work together with the cabinet, to get to work together with the glass, I think thinking about it as a system, that's, that's the challenge. You try to rebuild any one piece and you go, oh, this is gonna be great, it's gonna work. And then you go, oh, well that breaks that other thing, that breaks that other thing, that breaks the other thing. And so, I. I really think the challenge is coming up with a system that works together to be the most efficient that it can be. That's the challenge and that's what we worked really hard to, to deliver. All right, if there are any other questions about the cabinet, I really love to have Brad talk about some of his inspiration for this game design and the layout. And at the end, we'll do some more Q&A. 
and I kind of want to talk to you about pricing and price points and some other things that we've learned from the show so far. So Brad. Yeah, so I'm, I'm super excited to uh, talk about this to show this off because uh, um, I, so throughout my life I've always been, uh, I was always inspired by like spaghetti westerns and things like that and then come to find out like when I went to school and started learning about art and film and things I was like oh like a lot of these spaghetti westerns are, you know, take a lot of inspiration from these old uh, Japanese films um, like Akira Kurosawa stuff and so like for years I've just had a lot of love and a lot of uh, inspiration come from uh, these kind of filmmakers um, the uh, you know obviously uh, coming from an animation background I like uh, um, things that like Studio Ghibli has come out with and so a lot of inspiration has come from uh, the things that I've learned throughout my life I did um, I taught English in Japan for a time um, and so I through that and then through a lot of study uh, and like trying to be as true to this theme as possible. Um, I've incorporated a lot of things with like some of the some of the rules modes that I think that I hope that are just going to be really fun for the player is to be able to uh, as you play to kind of to choose basically between uh, a list of eight uh, Japanese deity um, that will help uh, create, um, which they're all they're all pictured here on the center. Um, but basically, these these deity will augment the game and boost, you know, uh, different parts of the game. And the hope is that by doing this, that each each play of the game, that you can choose a different pathway. And as you're combining two of these eight, that there's a lot of possibilities. And so hopefully, as you find what you like what your play style is, um, you can adjust and you can find new ways to keep playing this. Um, yeah, so we originally, we like when I first started, I started with the castle and wanted to, uh, you know, because if we're going to have this be, uh, you know, obviously we have this big daddy um, and I was like, well, he's got to be in a castle. We've got to have like a castle on there. Um, and so from that we kind of expanded from there and a lot of a lot of the decisions uh, came from like trying to incorporate things that are ninja like so we have this uh, in the left outline we have a kickback that shoots over across the play field into this right middle scoop which shoots to this left scoop which shoots to this upper flipper which in my mind was like this ninja, you know, he's, he's out there fighting, he gets thrown off, and he's, you know, he's like springing right back into action and is immediately back up at the top of the play field. Um, and there, there's just a lot of things like that. I placed the, the bumpers in a way where I was hoping uh, to encourage players to try to use them to ricochet and try to, uh, get shots into um, you know into the upper play field to make uh, shots more hittable um, so there's a lot of stuff like that this upper loop ramp um, there this upper ramp is loopable um, and the the idea with this was you know, uh, in a lot of you know samurai movies there's always a guy going to town uh, on his opponent and the, the hope is that this this upper flipper be used as like the the sword ramp is what we call it, and so you can just loop it and loop it and loop it. Um, and we have a three three ball physical lock up here on the right, um, which all of these I mean I I could talk about the artistic choices and things for these for far too long and. <laughs> Um, but this this upper right section is uh, like a, a ninja village essentially. So as you're locking balls, you're summoning your ninja uh, companions to come help you in this fight as you battle uh, the evil Oni Nushoku and his uh, uh, demons that he's brought into this world. So, uh, so that's about it. I can't wait for you guys to come up and see it closer.
I mean, I, I, I have a lot of them. I mean, I, so I got into pinball in 2018, so relatively, uh, you know, that's a relatively short amount of time. Um, so I, I, I've had a lot of inspiration. Like I, I started to watch um, Papa tutorials like every lunch, that's what I did. I would eat my lunch, watch a pinball tutorial. And I really started to open my eyes to all of these different designers, all these great uh, games that already exist. And I was lucky enough to be able to rub shoulders with like Dennis Nordman, with Barry Orsler, and like working with them is just awesome. And I like there's there's just so many games like to list any of them. I'm like I don't know. There's there's just a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. So I wanted to try something different with the upper flipper. Usually they're the upper flippers are towards the outside of the game which removes, I mean, it basically makes it less problematic. It doesn't get in the way. And my concern with this one was that if it was tied to a single button, I was worried with, um, now I know that l stacked leaf switches are pretty standard in like, you know, a lot of JJP games, a lot of games with secondary flippers use those um, if they want to be able to stage those. Um, but my my concern was if novice players didn't use those, that if activating both of these right flippers, it, since this upper flipper is in the middle here, it blocks off some of these shots. And so one re so the concern was, you know, do we use two buttons that way that whenever you use that flipper, it is intentional instead of getting blocked off. And as we've done testing, like we have two machines here at the show, one with the single button on the right, one with two on the right. And it seems pretty uh, universal that the single flipper is the better option. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I think it's generally it uh, you know, people people miss miss it, you know, when they first play it, they're like, they see the ball go up that uh, that upper flipper and they press the right one and then they're like, oh, there's a second flipper, like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if that's it, then. All right, so uh, we'll get the glass back on and then uh, I'll kind of show you how it exits service mode, just so we can kind of uh, wrap that part up and then I uh, also want to talk to you more about the cabinet and the pricing and then uh, kind of just have some dialogue with you about the price and the cabinet and the the uniqueness of it and how it sets with y'all. Uh, also on that uh, flipper button topic we're just going to make it a menu option so we'll put the two flipper buttons on there you can customize in the menu the way you like it and then you can have it either way. I think that's kind of the, the happy compromise between both. So uh, Gabe, you want to go ahead and demonstrate getting the glass back on? So it kind of just slides along and then it rests, oh, I'm sorry, it slides along and it rests up in the top and then a firm press right in the middle, re-engages the glass and the lights all come back on. And so it's just really easy to get in and out and uh, we hope that's something you'll really enjoy. Uh, one other thing I wanted to talk about uh, about the pin access app that I didn't mention earlier uh, in talking about the coin door and all that, um, the pin access app is an open system. And so we designed it with integration in mind. And so I hope that it's something that we can get the other manufacturers on board with. I would love to see pin access being used by everybody. And my team can work with their teams to actually help with that integration. And so I'm actually talking with the other manufacturers now about trying to do that, and I hope that that's something that will come in the future. But right now, um, we're working on proving it out as Turner Pinball being the first customer of Pin Access. So back to the cabinet stuff, um, I really want to kind of talk to you about some of the things that I've heard at the show. I want to get your opinions and impressions, and then uh, my team had had some extensive discussions last night about these things and kind of what strategies we should take. So really just uh, open dialogue to, to understand what you all think. So 
people would walk up to this and they're, they're kind of walking up from a distance and as they see it, before they've even approached the machine or know anything about it, they haven't seen the play field yet or anything, they see no coin door and they see the slim cabinet and they say, oh, this is a, this is a home pin. It's a, a Stern Home Edition or someone even said Zizzle, which I didn't even know what that was. It's like, it looks like a machine that came from Walmart that costs like, made out of cardboard and <laughs> costs like 50 bucks. <laughs> so I was a little like, oh my goodness, <laughs> like that is not what we're going for here. So I, I started to engage with people and I really think that they just walk up and I think the cabinet is, they're just used to seeing what everybody else is doing and has done for years. And the only times that the industry has diverged from that cabinet is when someone went for a really cheapened model. And I think that that's dam the damaged the reputation of the small cabinet. So that when we come with a cabinet that's really a, a totally premium offering, they look at it from a distance and they go, oh, that must be made out of cardboard, it's probably cheap. So definitely not the case, not what we were going for. My plan was to sell 100 of this as the first edition in this cabinet. And in the future, we want to have a tiered system. Uh, the, the plan for our tiers is an arcade edition, an epic edition, and a legendary edition. So that will be our three tiers. And so those would correspond with, if, you know, Stern has kind of set the standard in this. So you've got the Stern Pro, Premium and Limited. That would be our arcade, epic, and legendary. And so this would be in line with our mid-tier, the epic edition, but we were calling it our first edition because it's our first 100 units. I wanted to go with this cabinet. I wanted the glass and all the things just like this because this is what our vision was of what's going to make pinball better. But ultimately, customers vote with their dollars, and I want this to be something that you all want. And I think what we've heard is that a lot of people really would love to have a standard cabinet. And we, I talked to my team last night and we explored our bomb cost on this and this machine is not cheap for us to make. Um, putting this in a standard cabinet with a coin door actually costs us quite a bit less. As I described earlier, this is a system and it was designed as a system and so the back box is removable, the glass is removable, the play field comes out, um, we don't have the coin door. If we put the coin door in, then we have to go to standard pinball glass because it's much more difficult to have these contacts and things in there when the coin door's in the way of that. And then people are used to the hinged back box and we don't have hinges, so we're not obscuring our art or anything like that. We think that having this be able to come off and move it separately is actually a better option because this weighs about 25 to 30 pounds and when you take that off, the cabinet is much more maneuverable. Uh, whether you're trying to get into your arcade or whether you're trying to get into your bonus room and go up your stairs, I think it's an easier cabinet to move around. So all those things were designed as a system. And if we put this in a standard cabinet, we kind of take away a lot of the elements of that system. And so what I would do is I would essentially offer a hinged back box, standard glass, in the rails like people are used to, a standard lockdown bar and a coin door, just like what everybody's used to in every other cabinet. And we would essentially align that with our arc arcade edition. And because it costs us less, we can offer it a lower price point. So this machine um, talked a lot with my team, other mentors in the industry, and uh, we were trying to find where this fit in the market relative to what's out there. In talking about it, um, again, Stern really setting the standard and a lot of the pricing and the tiered structure, we looked at the Stern limited to premium and we said that it fell somewhere in between there based on the features that we have in this cabinet. And so we priced it accordingly. The, the release price, which we opened up yesterday, is 9777 So a Stern premium, $9,700. We priced it right in that range. And so the, the arcade edition, based on the the costs in the bomb that would go down as a result of taking back some of the innovation that we put into this cabinet, we can actually bring that cost down by over $1,000. It would cost about eighty-four seventy-seven is what we would price an arcade edition of this at, in a standard cabinet without the removable glass, without the RGB lighting under the glass, with a standard hinge back box, with a coin door, and without the mechanical ball lock and a couple other optional features of the play field. And so I guess what I want to hear from you all is, is that desirable? Is that what 
you're looking for because ultimately again the customers vote with their dollars and I want to sell you what you want I don't want to sell I don't want to have to force you to believe that this is the best pinball machine I want you to believe that it's the best and I want you to buy it because you believe that and so I'd love to engage in some dialogue about what do you want out of Ninja Eclipse do you like this would are you a buyer of the the epic edition or are you really someone that says, you know what, the, the arcade is what I'm really looking for. I just want something that's going to fit into my lineup. I want something I can put coins in. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know if y'all heard that, but essentially the operators, as they move their machines around to token-based or coin-based locations, they're swapping out components of their coin door to service these different locations. So arcade edition for operators. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, so I don't want to exclude anyone from purchasing a machine. I mean, I'd love to sell as many machines as I can sell. So to exclude any market, I think, would be foolish. Yeah. That's what it is, Jonathan. Yeah, it's, I think it's the perception, right? And if people are perceiving the lack of coin door as something that's actually less value, I can pay less for the overall product and I can deliver what they think is better value. So I'm happy to do that if that's what folks want. So there's so much more that we can do with this, right? I mean, art blades, toppers, um, some fancy things that I'll keep a secret for now. But this is definitely not the best that we can bring you in terms of a blinged out pinball machine. I think it's outstanding and aligns with a premium slash our epic edition. That would be like, you know, the, the limited, the collector's edition. And I think there's a place in the market for those. I think there are people that want those special machines and we can certainly bring that to those people that want that. And so I want to have an edition that allows us to c push those boundaries for people that are willing to spend those extra dollars on those kind of really high end features. And that's just from a distance, right? You haven't played it. You haven't played it. You haven't seen the play field. But just from a distance, your perception is like looks like a home pin because of the slim cabinet. And so I think, I think it's going to take time for people to come around to the fact that there can be a slim cabinet that's actually not a cheap cabinet. And I think that, as I mentioned before, the, the people that have made these slim cabinets before I arrived here have damaged the reputation of the slim cabinet because they made it look like an economy, budget, cheap, bad offering. Yeah. But that's not what this is, and it's not what it's meant to be, and it certainly doesn't cost me <laughs> the price that would be in line with that. And so again, I, I'm going to keep this available for the people that want this edition, but if people want the arcade edition, I, I don't see why I shouldn't allow that. Dennis. Oh, yes. It absolutely is, yeah. Um, 
Thank you so much. <laughs> we kind of talked about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I appreciate those comments so much. And you've been a huge innovator in cabinet design, Dennis. So, I mean, I, I was really hoping you would like it. And I, I'm so happy to hear that feedback. I... A Corvette compared to a semi. I appreciate it. That's a great analogy. And I kind of feel the same way. That's right. And I... I totally agree. I. <laughs> it, what is it? A pin. Yes. Yep. Yeah, we're uh, we're working on that. Might get some some of your advice on it. <laughs> Stefan. Oh, I'm so sorry. I don't see you back there. Hold on, just a second. Yes, sir. So, yeah, the question is about accessibility. And actually, Brad, our designer, like, we worked together to come up with this cabinet design. And he's got several models of wheelchair accessible legs that would fit on this cabinet. And so it's something that we have been looking at. And if people want it, it is something that we can offer. So I'm sorry, in the back over there. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> I appreciate that feedback. Yeah, we've tried to incorporate some of the rules and things down here and also in areas of the play field, like some kind of older style machines have done. But I think there's opportunity for improvement. We'll certainly look at that. Thank you. So Dennis, back to what you were saying with the cabinet. Um, after having this in our workshop next to the other machines, I just I kept looking at this and I look over at the other cabinets and I was like, oh man, they look so disproportionately large. <laughs> And so I kind of had the same the same view of the cabinet. But again, uh, we'll continue to offer this as our higher end model and then uh, open up that arcade edition for those that want that cabinet with the coin door. Other comments or questions on that? Jonathan. Well, so I... I'm afraid that if we use the smaller coin door, people might say the same thing. They go, oh, you got a small coin door. It's cheap. It's it's a home pin. Or I don't like that coin door because it doesn't look like every other coin door. <laughs> I'm afraid that I might just get the same pushback on a small coin door. But a small card reader would totally go in here. Yeah, and we can accommodate that easily. 
<laughs> with a USB charger for your phone. Hey, that's an innovation right there. I like it. Yeah. I see him. Yes. So I, I tried to mention that earlier, but the, the price point for this one is at uh, 9777 and we can actually knock that down to 8477 for the arcade model. So it's a substantial savings for us to go to a standard cabinet with a coin door without the glass and the other innovations. Yeah. <laughs> done. <laughs> We're going to update the website when I'm done, and you can select when you make the reservation, and... For those have, that have already reserved, I assume they want this one, but if they want the arcade one, they can just email me and tell me they, they would prefer the arcade. So, yeah, my pleasure. Other questions, comments? Oh, <laughs> I, ke I need to look more to the left, I'm sorry. <laughs> So ball sticking in the play field, you're asking about the ball trap. I don't quite understand the ball sticking in the play field. Oh, you mean for this trough design. So uh, we, have an, we do have a magnet in the play field, and we also have a Newton ball. The Newton ball kind of works as a demagnetizer. Um, based on, I mean, we've been through several iterations of the trough, and this one is extremely robust and reliable. We haven't had issues with jams or anything. Like, have we had... I mean, how many plays have we had on this so far? Probably several hundred. Any ball jams in the trough that you guys know of? No. So, I mean, we've been playing it in our shop. W <laughs> previous versions, not so robust, but we've worked hard to get it to this level, and we feel that this trough is a trough that works and a trough that is easier to access and service. Yeah, so the comment essentially is that um, until we get further along with the pin access system and it's more widely adopted that maybe the coin door is going to be a necessity for people, but that in the future maybe they'll be more open to a, a smaller design without a coin door. I totally agree, and I think that's the process that we're going to try to embark upon, right? Working with these uh, arcades to initially adopt it through the, the demo customers and then using those testimonials to show other people how great it is, how affordable it is, how it's making their businesses better and easier to run. And then over time, people are going to say, hey, maybe we don't need that coin door anymore, and maybe we can have the really stylish cabinet. But Yep. Yeah, so the operator just wants to get the money, whether it's electronic or, or coins. Totally get it. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for those kind words. I certainly appreciate it. And it's kind of been a labor of love for our team. I mean, we, we approached this with fresh eyes and really tried to, to look at it and say, how can we make the pinball experience better? And, and this is what we came up with. And uh, I think as people have come up to our booth, you know, even the ones that were kind of like, oh, that looks like a home pin or something, they come up and then I demonstrate some of these features and they're like, oh, wow, why isn't everybody doing this? And so it, 
those things have been rewarding. Uh, you know, it's it's always hard to bring something new and have criticism of it. But I understand that, you know, people are used to the things that they're used to, and it, it's going to take time. And so hopefully offering the arcade edition and the epic edition side by side will give people options that will let the people that are not quite ready for this to have what they're used to, and then the people that are willing to kind of take a leap for something new to have something new. So I guess that's the approach we'll take. Jonathan? So the question is about our manufacturing capability. And so that's something that we're working through right now. And that's also part of our strategy on releasing 100 units of this. So I know that I can't manufacture 1,000 in the space that I have right now. And so our plan for manufacturing 100 of these in essentially a 3,000 square warehouse is to order parts for the machines. We make the cabinetry and the, a lot of the play field and things in-house on a CNC. And so I can do those on demand as I'm running them. And I can probably build five to 10 at a time and then ship. And that's how we plan to do it. And so what we're going to do is we're going to kind of take a, a calculated small approach to that. We'll build and ship the units incrementally like that and then through the process of building and shipping those, I'm going to learn what we need to do to scale that up. And then we'll take the next step after that. But I think trying to jump in, uh, hey, we're going to get a 20,000 square foot space and we're going to have all this equipment and stuff. We've seen that done and we've seen how that works out. And I, I want to take it slow and learn and do it right. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I I understand the, the things that have gone on in the industry have made people skeptical of new companies that come in. I think that we're demonstrating that we've built this in a year. I mean, basically a year ago we started this and we've been able to bring two production-ready machines to a show to have people use and flip. And so I hope that that shows something. That shows something about the dedication of our team. And also in terms of the way that we're processing uh, the payments, we're taking a $150 reservation fee for our machines. We're not taking a $1,000, $2,000 deposit, right? We're not trying to fund our venture with reservation fees. So we're trying to make it where it's a low-risk approach for someone that wants to get a machine. And our plan is to deliver these by spring of 2024. And I think I'm out of time. But thank you all so much. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it.